things that you need to know. Ready? Let's do it. Here we go. First Amendment. Fourth Amendment. Fifth Amendment. Sixth Amendment. Eighth Amendment. Ninth Amendment. Fourteenth Amendment. Nineteenth Amendment. Twenty-fourth Amendment. Okay? So, at the very least, we should start here. Okay? So, uh, let's start off with the First Amendment. Okay? What are the four freedoms in the First Amendment? Speech, religion, religion. let's start off, let's start with, we have speech, religion, assembly. assembly, and petition, very good, petition the government, okay, so here are the four freedoms of the First Amendment, um, what are the two that we really focused on, speech, speech, and religion. speech and religion, right, speech and religion, okay, so, uh, we will come back and talk about specific cases after we finish all the amendments. But remember, which of these has have two different clauses that you need to know the differences between? Religion. What are the names of the two clauses dealing with religion? The establishment clause and the free exercise clause. Very good. What is the what are the first words of the First Amendment? It says what? Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibit the free exercise thereof. Okay, so those two things mean very different things and therefore they have their own, you know, series of, of court cases that you need to know. Okay, so that's the First Amendment. We'll come back to the court cases in just a minute. Okay, what is the Fourth Amendment? Know what? No unreasonable searches and seizures. Okay? Remember, 4, 5, 6, 8, and 9 are all the what amendments? Due process. Due process amendments, right? The Fifth Amendment has three clauses you need to know. Three things. What are the three things in the Fifth Amendment you must know? Double jeopardy. Self-incrimination. Okay, self-incrimination. And the right to speak or act and just... Nope. Nope. Imminent domain. Right? Those are three things in the Fifth Amendment. Sixth Amendment. Okay, remember, one of the tricks is to remember this is in chronological order, right? So when they're collecting evidence, right? Uh, and then when they start talking to you and putting you on trial. And then once you're in the trial, you have a right to a what? A speedy trial. By what? By one's peers. And we'll just put counsel there. Because it says in the Sixth Amendment that you have that you can have an attorney, but we all know that a case came around and, and said something in, uh, in addition to that. Okay, so now you've gone through the trial, you're guilty. Uh, now, what does the Eighth Amendment deal with? Punishment. Okay, this is a ban on what? No cruel and unusual punishment. Okay, so that's the Eighth Amendment, okay, and again, we all know what's the big issue we're going to come back to in a minute? The death penalty, okay. Now, the Ninth Amendment is what? Kind of, kind of privacy, that's right, but I mean in a broader sense. No warrant. Wow. Unenumerated powers. Or, I'm sorry, in unenumerated rights. Okay, is the Ninth Amendment. Okay, and we all know that eventually that becomes something else. Okay. Fourteenth uh, Amendment. What are the three important clauses there? Citizenship. Citizenship clause, good. What are the other two? Equal, Equal protection. Process. And due process. Very nice. Okay. What's the 19th Amendment? Okay, gave women the right to vote.
Okay, 24th Amendment. What about poll taxes? It banned poll taxes. Okay, there we go. So, uh, those are the amendments that you should know at the very minimum. Again, how many of you guys feel like you've done a decent job on your note cards? Okay? Even though I told you guys these are really, you know, the note cards are primarily for amendments, excuse me, for court cases, it would not be a bad idea to do these for amendments, too, right? It would not be a bad idea right now to say, okay, what's the Fifth Amendment? Okay, three things I need to know about. Yes, sir? What's the Eleventh Amendment? The Eleventh Amendment dealt with being able to sue. Uh, it came out of an early case where they said that uh, governments could be sued, and the Eleventh Amendment was saying, no, you can't. It was reversing an earlier Supreme Court decision. It's very obscure. It's kind of like that. The Seventh Amendment. Okay. Talk about that that thing just came to mind. Yeah, no, the Eleventh Amendment and the Fourteenth. I, I don't know. I confuse it either. But, um, anyhow, okay. So, any questions about this? Is this helpful? What I'm doing here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, what we want to do is we want to go back and say, well, are there any court cases dealing with the issues within these amendments? Okay. And what are those court cases? And why are they important? Okay. So. Um, you guys want to start in the First Amendment? Kind of the stuff that was uh, from the beginning? Okay, so let's start off with the very beginning. Let's start off the speech. And you will remember we, we had a, a really kind of dramatic day about a month ago where I talked about you know, why is freedom of speech so important? Why is freedom of conscience important? And we talked about the marketplace of ideas. And, and who was the philosopher who said, even if it's a bad idea, a repugnant idea, it's a wrong idea, it's important to have it articulated because it essentially shows, it allows you to figure out um, and have to explain why it is a wrong idea. Who was that? John Stuart Mill. John Stuart Mill. Very good. Excellent. Uh, John Stuart Mill, uh, one of my favorite philosophers, who said, you know, you need a robust marketplace of ideas, um, and it, it is error clashing with truth. That is the true utility of free speech. And so when we talk about speech, though, there are all kinds of issues, right? All kinds of issues. Let's kind of, let's list them out a little bit, right? We have prior restraint is an issue. We have national security and fighting words. We have libel and slander. We have a student free speech. We have symbolic free speech. We have obscenity. Remember all this stuff? Okay, and so these are all the issues we're talking about in regards to, to free speech. Okay, and so um, again, I'm, I'm gonna I'm not gonna write out all the court cases uh, right now, but I'll, what I'll do is I'll list them out. Okay, and I'm doing this off the top of my head. So if you guys want to add something because you got all your notes there, feel free to. Okay, uh, I guess I'm forgetting something. Okay, so um, we start off with an easy one, and that was prior restraint. And if you'll recall, prior restraint dealt with essentially prior restraint is a kind of a fancy term for what? Censorship, yeah. Uh, this question in 1931 of, of can the government stop a newspaper from printing or stop you from saying something? Uh, and essentially what they said was uh, in, in the court case of Near versus Minnesota, remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Minnesota. Uh, in Near versus Minnesota, they said, no, you can be punished later on, but you can't prevent somebody from saying it or writing it beforehand, right? That, that's, kind of a, that's a kind of European absolutist uh, habit that we don't want to get. Uh, so that's prior restraint. Now, really probably the focal point of this, uh, of speech, is national security and fighting wars. And there are quite a few court cases here. Uh, but I want you guys to remember here, what is the paradigm that we always use? The always, what is always the clash here? The individual saying, in this instance, saying something, versus the community who has a law that says there are certain things you can't say in certain times. Or at least you can be punished for saying certain things. Okay? And... The most important court case, and you might, again, you might want to remember this for your final exam and for the AP test, what is the one free speech court case that you have to know? Shank versus U.S., absolutely. That is the famous, 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 famous one from 1919. Uh, and if you will recall, uh, you had something called the Espionage Act, uh, which said that, you know, you can't use your speech in times of war to... Uh, and, and what did Shank do? What did he do? Yeah, he said avoid, avoid the draft, right? And so he was using a speech to say avoid the draft, resist World War One, blah 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 blah. 
And you have the Espionage Act, you know, you're know, you going to be punished if you, if, you, if you call for these kinds of things. And of course, it was a balance between the community that says, your speech is putting our national security at risk, and Shank saying, well, it's my view. Why shouldn't I be able to say it? And remember, this is 1919. It's Oliver Wendell Holmes. And who did they side with? The community and the, and, and, and the law? Or did they side with Shank? They sided with the community. Yeah, they sided with the community on that. Okay, so Shank... Can't, you cannot use your speech to put everybody else's life in danger. And the very famous quote from Shank versus the U.S. is, that is like yelling fire, fire. fire in a crowded theater. Right? So that's Shank. And then in 1951, in 1951, 33 years later, you have Dennis versus U.S. You remember Dennis was the head of the, he was a high-ranking official for the Communist Party. Right? And he said, we should, you know, let's call for the violent overthrow of the government, and in 1951, yet again, they, they, they altered it a little bit. Um, and what was, the, oh, sorry, go back to Shank, what was the important test that Shank created? You know, if your speech presents a what? A clear and present danger, then it, it can be limited, okay? Uh, you had a question. Um, yeah, do we need to know the dates besides the fact that... You need to know the era. Yeah. Yeah, you don't need to know dates, no, you do not, you, but you need to know that that's kind of the early jurisprudence of the courts dealing with the First Amendment, okay? Um, and then, of course, after Schenck and after Dennis, you begin to have a new court, right? And, and, and what court came around? What was kind of the liberal court? The Warren Court. The Warren Court, right? Mid-50s to kind of late 60s. And, of course, you had two court cases. Uh, well, actually, still, 19, and in the 1940s, you had a court case. Uh, uh, in Chaplinsky versus New Hampshire, remember that one? I remember Chaplinsky, where he, 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 you know, was essentially was, was calling religion names, and then the, the cop tried to save him, and he and he called the the the, the, the cop a, a GD fascist. You remember that? And he said, you know what, you're disturbing the peace. And so in Chaplinsky versus New Hampshire, this is 1940s. They affirm, yeah, you can't use your speech because if you're using your speech to try and get people to fight, right? Uh, it's 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 that's not protected, right? You're just trying to to get people to be unrestful and, and, and you're trying to get them to, 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 to be provoked, you can't use your speech like that. So kind of those three are in the same universe, kind of the Shank, the Chaplinsky, the Dennis, those are all together. But then in the 1960s you have a shift, two court cases. Remember Yates versus U.S. and Brandenburg versus Ohio, remember this? Where they said, they, they shifted and said, you can say the most dreadful, horrible things in the world, uh, you can talk about lynchings and encourage it. You can call for the violent throw, overthrow of the government. You can do these things as long as you don't actually do it. As long as you don't actually act on it, right? And so that's where, you know, you see this, this seismic constitutional shift uh, in the 1960s with Yates versus U.S. and Brandenburg versus Ohio. And, and that's where we remain today, and we know that because of, uh, remember the Snyder decision? Better known as the what? The Westboro Church. Remember that? Um, and, and remember those horrible pictures of those people saying those horrible things about the dead soldiers? But that idea that you might say repugnant things, but just because it's unpopular doesn't mean you don't have a right to say it, right? Remember Voltaire's famous quote, I might not agree with the word that you say, but I will fight to the death for your right to say it, right? So really, the focal point of speech is probably on this issue right here. It's kind of that clear and present danger, community versus individual, right? But again, remember that a lot of cases there. Now, libel and slander, okay? Um, remember there are two important court cases here. The most important one is New York Times versus Sullivan, which said that if you are going to prove libel or slander, you have to prove two things. What do you have to prove? Malicious, malicious intent and a reckless disregard for the truth. You got to prove both. It's not an or; it's an and. Okay. So, uh, New York Times versus Sullivan in 1964 really dictated what the rules of proving libel and slander are. But then, in kind of the famous case, you know, kind of the, the, the funny case uh, of, of of Jerry Falwell versus Hustler magazine, what that said was though that you know it's going to be even tougher to prove libel or slander if you're what kind of an individual. If you're a public person, if you're a celebrity, people are going to make fun of you. It's going to be satire. These X-rated horrible things that Hustler Magazine said about Jerry Falwell, uh, nobody would take them as the actual truth. It was a spoof. It was a joke. It was a satire. It was making fun of him, right? Because he's, you know, he was a Christian minister saying these outlandishly X-rated things. And so, you know, if you're a public person, it's going to be even tougher uh, to prove it. So that's that's libel and slander. Um, I think it was. Uh... 
versus the New York Times, I think. But um, he sued them for libel, and then it fell through because he was saying, like, they, they published this article on it, and as a whole, they, the, when the court said it was not libel, but they did say later on if he had sued them for, because they called them anarchists, it's like if they had sued him for using the word anarchist, then it would have gone through because in a previous what, For case, the president? No. Oh. So that doesn't make any sense. The four, um, I did not know what, why the president would be. No, it, it was not just the time. Yeah. Um, that, and, and it was, uh, they, they called him an anarchist. And uh, he took offense to that. So he, um, but, but it's like he sued for the whole article. And he said he kind of, he sued just for, an, for the word anarchist because certain words were right. declared to have libelous intent. I think is what they said. Was it the 70s? It was, it was on a, a test I took before or something like that, and then afterwards I kind of looked it up, but... Okay, now, let's go on to student-free speech, Nina. Um, so what was the other thing, malicious intent, and what else? Oh, reckless disregard. Oh, reckless disregard for the truth, yeah. Okay, now, uh, we talk about student-free speech. What is the five-star court case there? Tinker versus Des Moines. Again, we're talking about 1960s, uh, 68, I think it was. Uh, remember the Vietnam armbands? They said liberal courts. Who are they going to side with? The kids or the uh, the school? The they side with the kids. Absolutely, they side with the kids. They said, you know, you do not sh you know shed your constitutional rights at the at the school gate. Uh, and of course, we all know how, has the has the Roberts court curtailed that a little bit. Yes, remember Morse versus Frederick? That's the one about bong hits for Jesus. Remember that? Uh, Right, right. They said that if it, yeah. I mean, that's why I said it was curtailed. So, uh, in the sense that they, uh, you know, they didn't say that a student has an absolute right to say anything, right? Um, if it had been a, a political message, they probably would have protected it. But it was, to a certain degree, kind of a pro-drug message. Uh, it can be interpreted that way, and therefore the school has a right to promote a drug-free zone, drug-free culture. So, Morse versus Frederick uh, was the other uh, student-free speech case, along with Tinker is the famous one. Uh, remember that's Miss Richards and Mr. Stubbe? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, finally, uh, two more, uh, symbolic free speech. Uh, this one's a big one. This is, uh, if I had to say that there was like a second case you should know, like if you had to know two, Shank versus U.S. The other one I would say is the symbolic one about flag burning, and that was what? Texas. Texas, Texas versus Johnson, where the Supreme Court said that flag burning is a form of free speech. Yeah, it was a 5-4 decision, uh, 1989 I think it was. Uh, and then finally, obscenity um, was is a very uh, unclear decision as well. Uh, remember the most famous quote ever in the 20th century is, you know, they were trying to, in the 1940s or 50s, they were trying to obs define obscenity and they couldn't. And they said, well, quote, I, no. I know when I see it. But what was the court case in the 1970s that tried to clarify it, while well, being very unspecifically? No. Uh, and that was who? Miller versus California. Miller versus California tried to it was an attempt to clarify it, and essentially, you know, what it said was, uh, you know, it can't appeal to the prurient interest, it it can't lack artistic merit, uh, but essentially, it has to conform to what standards? Community, Community standards. Exactly. Was that one thing? No, uh, Senator O'Connor didn't come to the court for the 1980s, right? And Miller, I believe, is in the 70s. Yeah. So. Um, so that is, those are the, uh, the six issues dealing with speech. Okay, you guys now understand why that took a week and a half to do? Yeah. Okay, just, just a speech. Okay, now, let's go on to religion. Okay, uh, and uh, remember, there's a difference here between the establishment and the free exercise clause. Again, what am I skipping right now? I'm skipping all the stuff about the Enlightenment philosophers, why do we believe in freedom of religion. The First Amendment is not there to, you know, mandate state atheism or to say that we have to be a Christian nation. The First Amendment and freedom of religion exist to, to, to promote a diversity. diversity of religion. Yeah, because freedom of religion, <clears throat> in some ways, really isn't about religion. It, it's about, yeah, creating a kind of a moral society with self-restraint so we can govern ourselves so that we can maximize individual liberty, right? That's really what the philosophy of freedom of religion is about. And so uh, the establishment of the free exercise clause mean very different things. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Why do we have that? Because we did not want to have what England had, or France had, which is church-established, uh, state-established churches. Uh, we didn't want our taxes going to supporting uh, religion. Uh, and so that's what the Establishment Clause is about. Nor prohibit the free exercise thereof means that we can't pass laws that stop people from freely exercising their religion. Don't forget, 
Why'd the pilgrims come over here? Yeah, we're to, to escape religious persecution. So again, a lot of that history, a lot of that religious heritage comes back from the early colonial days. Yeah. We get tax breaks for... Um, but that's for charity. Yeah. Even if it's donating comes to the church? Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, it, it, it's a charitable organization. That's why. Right? And it's non-political or non-political. But uh, to be honest, some churches are. But um, at any rate, though, so let's talk about the, uh, the establishment uh, jurisprudence really fast. Uh, number one, the first, the big issue, this is the one you should know for religion. If there's one you should know, it's this one. Uh, and that is about school prayer. And you remember Engel versus Vitale, 1962? Uh, that you, can you have prayer in schools? Yes. 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 You can't have school led prayer, right? There's a difference, okay? So you can't have school led prayer. Um, the other big issue dealing with the establishment clause is what about parochial aid? What is the big test? What do you call that? The Lemon Test, right? Lemon versus Kurtzman, uh, where they tried to say, well, the money can go to religious schools as long as the money has a secular, very good, a secular purpose. So, you know, if you want to buy biology books or you want to uh, build a gymnasium, that's fine, but you can't go to teacher salaries, you can't go bu build Bibles, you can't, uh, you know, go on field trips. The money's got to be used for a secular purpose. It can't you know, have an excessive entanglement with religion. Uh, it can't help nor hinder religion. Remember all those things. So that's the lemon test, and that's 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 another big issue with with a parochial. Uh, excuse me, with the establishment clause. So school prayer, parochial aims. Uh, what about what about prayer groups on campus? Uh, not during school hours. West Side versus Mergens. Uh, you can have them, uh, but it has to be at lunch, at lunch before school, after school. Uh, what about having a prayer before a football game? Uh, yeah, they said no to that one, though, because <clears throat> uh, Santa Fe versus Doe, because you're using a school event and school equipment uh, to, to promote religion. Uh, so that's, that's uh, prayer groups. Yeah? You can't pray within your team? No. Yeah, 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 you can, you can, that's fine, yes. But it has to be student-led. Hey, they were doing it on the loudspeaker, wasn't that it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they were doing it. The, you know, they were doing it for the entire. And then one person to the So that's where the dough came from, right? So uh, yeah, uh, you, you can do it amongst yourselves, yeah, as long as it's voluntary. Yeah. I'm sure that um, whatever Garces has their own games, they do like a prayer. They're a, they're a religious. They're not a public. That doesn't like. No, because, Dude, they're uh, private. They're private. They're they're private. They do whatever they want to do. They can come in and they can say Jesus so many times a day, and that's all they'd say. Jesus, 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 Jesus. That'd be fine. They can tell you to pray for five hours. That's fine. It's a parochial school. You do whatever they can, they can do that. That's why you have private schools, so you can do things that you can't do in public schools. Well, I don't know. Yeah, it depends how they did it. Um, so, uh, next big issue would be uh, evolution. Remember this? Okay, and Epperson versus Arkansas. Remember, Arkansas passed a law saying you can't teach evolution. The Supreme Court said no to that. Uh, in the 1980s, Louisiana passed something called the Equal Access Act, or a Equal Access Law, that said you have to teach, you can teach evolution, but you have to teach creationism along with that, uh, in Edwards versus Aguilar. And what did the Supreme Court say? Can't do that either, because that's promoting what kind of monotheism, right? So that's, that's evolution um, and, and religion. Now, what about the Ten Commandments? Where can you and where can you not? Where can you? Yes, in the state capital, but not on a, not in a, like nineteen eighty in Stone versus Graham. They said no in, in the corner. classroom, and they also said no to a Kentucky courtroom. Yeah, but yes, already there on the capital. I think it was in Texas where there was the Commandments Yeah, but the, it had already been there, yeah, whereas the Kentucky courtroom had just been placed there. The other one had been there for a while. I remember Breyer was kind of that swing vote there. He said yes to one, but no to the other. And his justification was, you know, we don't want to have to go and uproot all these religious symbols that have been there for a long time, but we don't condone placing them there again. Especially when you could call them Yeah, well, I mean, you can argue that all the way back on the, on the classroom. But yeah. I can't remember. Um, there's a thing where it's like they want to teach creationists, they say no, because it's probably the one religion. What if you decided to teach like the six major religions? I, 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 I would think they would probably say, well, there are hundreds of religions. You know, the best way to do it is just to avoid teaching religion. 
quoting science. I mean, I think that's probably what they would they would say. So uh, I think those are all the establishment clause issues. Is that is that correct? Am I right? So school groups, teaching evolution, uh, parochial aid, school led prayer. Is that everything? And the Ten Commandments. I think those are the five things. Okay. Now let's go to the free exercise class. Three cases you need to know. Okay. U.S. versus Reynolds, which said, you know, you cannot practice bigamy. Uh, in other words, is the is the anti bigamy act okay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you have uh, Employment Division of Oregon versus Smith, uh, where the guy was smoking peyote as a part of his, his ritual, his religious ritual. Uh, and yet he was being tested for drugs, and they wouldn't give him, uh, you know, what he wanted because he tested positive. Uh, what did the Supreme Court say that? Did they sided with the Oregon law? Did that violate the free exercise clause? They sided with Oregon. They sided with Oregon. What is the only real exception we talked about? It's broad, so it's not like against. No, no. What, what case? If they target specifically. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. What I meant was, what court case did they side with the individual though? Yoder versus Wisconsin, right? And that was because it dealt with. Who? The Amish, yeah, because they were kind of a community within a community. But generally speaking, you guys are right. They're always going to side with the state or the national law because you can't, otherwise you're going to be using religion to justify breaking the law. the law. And you can't do that. The only time they really side with the individual is when, if, as if a law targets a specific religion. And, that, and that's not okay. That is breaking the free exercise clause. But if it's just a very broad law that applies generally and it happens to be against your religion, that's kind of too bad. Okay? What? Black like murder. Like murder, yeah, exactly. Right? So those are the three court cases you need to know about uh, for a free exercise. Okay? Uh, now, Fourth Amendment. One court case you need to know. It is an it is an incorporation case. Matt versus Ohio created the exclusionary rule. You dang well better know that one. That's really important. We talked about that one forever. The Fifth Amendment. One court case you need to know. Miranda versus Arizona. Okay, Dan well better know that one. That is not an incorporation case. Sixth Amendment, Gideon versus Wainwright. You have the right to a lawyer. The, the state must provide one for you. Okay, that is an incorporation case. You dang well better know it. Eighth Amendment, Greg versus Georgia. Didn't mandate the, the death penalty. All it said was if a state wants to have the death penalty, it is not ipso facto unconstitutional, right, to do that. Okay, so that's the Eighth Amendment. Uh, Greg versus Georgia, obviously not an incorporation case. Ninth Amendment. Now, unenumerated rights. Now, this became important in 1965 in the blockbuster five-star court case, Griswold versus Connecticut. And this dealt with artificial birth control. And what, what the Supreme Court did was they, they combined the Ninth Amendment with primarily which other one? The Fourth. Right? And you could argue the First and the Third as well. But really, the Ninth and the Fourth Amendment were combined to create a general right to what? Right. A general right to privacy, okay? And of course, then that was extended in 1973 in what court case? Roe v. Wade, right. So the Fourth and the Ninth Amendment are kind of combined. Uh, and remember, what do you call privacy? What do you call abortion? What do you call all of these rights that are not listed? They're there, but they're kind of in the shadows. We call that a what? A penumbra, right? That is called a penumbra, right? Okay, now... Fourteenth Amendment, okay? Citizenship clause. We all know that uh, essentially if you are born in this country, you are a citizen. That has given rise to a phenomenon called the anchor baby uh, issue. Uh, now, due process clause. What are the two amendments that use the phrase due process? Fifth and fourteenth. Fifth and fourteenth. Why is the fourteenth amendment due process clause different than the fifth? Because, it's, yeah, it says that states cannot you know, uh, take away life, liberty, or property without due process of law. This has been used, this phrase, the 14th Amendment, has been used to start the most important practice in, the, in 20th century jurisprudence called selective incorporation. That is all over your exam tomorrow, and you should know that already. Selective incorporation is all, is all over that test tomorrow. Okay? Uh, and so, what do I mean by selective incorporation? The Supreme Court took different rights in the Bill of Rights and incorporated them at once, or did they do it uh, right by right? Right by right. Yeah, I mean, that's why it's called selective. What is the most recent one in 2010? Second, Second Amendment. Yeah, it was incorporated in 2010. So make sure you know all about that. Um, you know, what, what, what was the 1833 case that said 
The Bill of Rights don't apply to the states. Yeah. Barron versus Baltimore, then in 1925, I believe, with Gitlow versus New York, they begin the process of incorporation. Uh, remember, the Third Amendment is not incorporated, the Seventh Amendment is not incorporated. Um, so make sure you know all about the due process clause of the Fourteenth Amendment. Really, 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 really important. The other one that's really, really, really important is equal protection. Uh, two court cases you need to know about the equal protection clause. Uh, obviously, Bakke versus the California Board of Regents, uh, which dealt with affirmative action and quotas, said no to quotas, yes to affirmative action. And then uh, uh, Brown versus the Board of Education, which reversed what 1896 decision? Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, and essentially uh, said on a 9-0 decision that you, you can no longer segregate, so you, you need to get rid of it with all deliberate speed, which was kind of code for the South to be able to, to, go, to go slow. Yeah. And of course, what clause did they, in a very enigmatic fashion, use to justify this? Commerce. Commerce clause, which is very weird. So, did you, was that a hand? Oh, no. Sure. Quickly, quickly. Was it Bruce Ferguson, one of those ones where it's like staged or something? I have no idea. I have no idea. Okay, so that is um, that is the, the, the you know the Brown decision. Um, again, we could get into the kind of get into the weeds about the Brown decision, uh, but remember that that it is the equal protection case of of the 20th century. Uh, 19th Amendment, don't worry about any cases. 24th Amendment, don't worry about any cases. I would remind you though, the two blockbuster, uh, you know, and, and there, I mean, are there any cases that I didn't mention here? Yeah, Dred Scott. Uh, you know, you need to know about Dred Scott a little bit. Um, but obviously, you need to know about the, the 64 Civil Rights Act. You need to know about the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Um, you need to know a little bit about the Civil Rights Movement and Rosa Parks and all the forms of, of protest. But um, how did I do? I didn't have any notes. So I